Miles Wright, you guys are, uh, are a bit quiet this morning. Forgive my administrative mess back here. Did Kyle really say, uh, are, you the, are you the Bible because I've read you every day? Is that what that was? Yeah, that's, that's wild. Um, the Bohemian Picnic, uh, that does not mean there's marijuana involved. Okay? Okay? So... Um, I was told not to bring my... No, I'm kidding. I don't, so we don't do that here. We don't do that here at all. So, uh, excited to have you guys here this morning. Uh, glad to hear some laughter. Uh, glad to hear that you guys are, are happy. Uh, I'm happy to be here today. It's a great day. Sunday, for me, is the best day. If you're new here or you haven't been around a long time, Sunday really is my favorite day of the week. Uh, oftentimes, our team will say, Chris, you should take a break. Don't come you know, on a Sunday. Take a Sunday off. And I'll tell them, like, if you want to give me a break, come on Tuesday and lead staff meeting. But let me have today. Today is the day that uh, that I really enjoy. Um, We've been in this series about learning how to fight. The the framework around what we're talking about is fighting for it. It, This is the year that we as a church are going to go out and we're going to fight for it. And yesterday we had a men's breakfast. So, ladies, you're going to have your, uh, your, your marijuana thing. And then the, <laughs> the guys, we, 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 because we do read our Bible and stuff, we met at Hog House yesterday and it was very holy and righteous. And, you know, we were praying over brekkie buns and it was a great turnout. We had about 40 guys there. So, really amazing. But I, I got a chance to kind of explain, you know, more of what we're talking about this, uh, in this series. And, thought this is a good way to kind of illustrate it to you. You know, I was able to challenge the guys, actually not just challenge them, but tell them, this is the kind of man that you're going to become this year, and you're going to have to fight to become that man. You're going to lead your families. You're going to lead your wives. You're going to lead your household. You're going to lead yourself. You're going to fight to do those things because the world doesn't want you to. And then also, you're going to help us lead this church. And so our church is going to be impacted because we have a whole bunch of men that have decided that they are going to fight for the impact that they can have on this house. So I'm just excited. I'm excited to see the kind of impact that we're going to see when these guys stand up. And uh, and a lot of them are already doing it, but as they continue to do that. But the first step in learning how to fight is... First, we have to, we talked about this in the first week. You've got to make a decision that you want to fight. You just got to decide, yes, I'm going to get in this fight. I'm going to pick this fight. And then after that, we talked about last week, what usually happens is we think, oh, no, why did I pick this fight? Because this is hard. And we, we talked about uh, Elisha and his servant, and it was the, the takeaway was you got to fight with your eyes open. And so once we have our eyes open, we start to realize that there's this whole spiritual world around us. And we talked about the army of angels that's around us. And so then, you know, we, we're encouraged. Like, okay, yeah, we can fight the hard battles. Because it's not just us alone. There's this whole spiritual world that's around us and supporting us. And that's all great, but there's one more aspect about fighting before we talk about kind of ending this thing off next week we're going to get into the book of revelation some and this is there's another aspect of fighting that we all deal with and we all go through now this is the part in the service where i want you to really clue in because if you want help dealing with something that i know you have to deal with i know you go through this i know you go through it i know you deal with it and if you want help with that then listen today. Because today, I I can give you something that can inspire you, that can help you to get through something that we all really struggle with. And it's this. What happens when your fight is between you and God? What about about that? See, we've been talking about the the, the fight, like we're going to fight for our marriage, our family, fight for ourselves. We're going to fight for freedom from addiction. We're going to, yeah, 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 rah, rah, rah. And then last week it was, hey, and if you feel down, that's okay. Pick yourself up because we've got all this support. We've got the angels behind us. Come on, let's go. And that's great when you're out there fighting against the world, especially if you feel like you've got God's army and his angels behind you. But so often, so many times, our actual fight, our actual battle is when we feel like it's between us and then God. So I would be completely just selling you guys short if I talked about 
This is the year we fight for things in our lives. If I talk about that, but I don't talk about the fight that we feel like we're in all the time. And it's that, that we feel like we're fighting against God. So is it okay? Is it okay for you to fight between, for you to fight with God? That doesn't mean that you just have no faith. Because if you had faith, why would you fight God? You wouldn't fight Him. You would just trust Him and follow Him and believe in Him. So if you're fighting with God right now, then shame on you. No, that's not it at all. If you're fighting with God, then welcome. (laughs) Welcome to the club. You know, especially uh, me up here. I'd like to personally welcome you to the club. I'm the president of Fighting with God. It doesn't mean that you're struggling with, with faith. And you know what? You may be struggling with faith, but it doesn't mean that there's something that's wrong with you. You know, is it a sin to fight with God? No, I don't think it's a sin to fight with God. Does it mean that, that you're carrying some kind of, you know, uh, uh, demon or something that's preventing you from accepting God and instead you're fighting against Him? No, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that either. And what, what it means is that you're, you're human, and you know what? This is a church for humans, for normal people. And everybody in this church, from who's up here on platform, all the way down to the person that's visited for the first time, we are just normal people. And I can tell you, I've, I fight with God. A lot of my fights are with God. And that's okay. So what would a, a God fight look like in your life? Let's, let's think through some of these examples. I want you to try and resonate and connect with this. Because if you can't connect with what this would be, you know, if you're asleep or you're zoning out or something, then like you're going to miss the whole rest of it. So let me show you some examples. Here's a lot of what our fighting with God can can be. Uh, It may be because of broken promises. You know, you feel like God has promised you something and it's not come true. And so now you're ready to fight and wrestle with him. God, where is that promise? God, why hasn't this come true? God, you promised that we would insert promise and then now, here we are, we don't have it. You know, for seven years, it's a number seven, okay? Not one year, two years, three years, seven years. Casey and I fought to stay in this country because Casey was given uh, a legal visa that went illegal in the, the home affairs system. And for seven years, she was blacklisted and protected by a lawyer to keep her here in this country and keep our family together. For seven years, we fought home affairs. And finally, seven years later, yes, we, we won. And Casey was given a legal visa and home affairs fixed their mistake and all that stuff. But for seven years, God, is this promise you gave me broken? Why or why? Why are we dealing with this? Aren't we supposed to be here? Can you promise us to be here? Is this not, are we not doing what you called us to do? How, how is it that we are uh, here called to lead a church to do all this stuff? And I, I, we can barely keep ourselves in, in the country legally. And it wasn't even anything that we did wrong. You know, the broken promises lead us to fighting with God. How, uh, this question, how could this be? It, it's this disbelief of a situation that you're in in your life where you think like, how, how, how is this possible? I'm a good guy. How could this be? God, how, how's this happening to us? It's not fair. So I, I, I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to wrestle with you. How is my situation okay? Where are you? That's a good one. God, where are you? You know, I, there's been situations in my life where I've fought God so hard and so much, and I've just asked Him over and over and over again, where are you, where are you? And guess what? There's even a situation... And it was a long period of time where I was asking God, where are you? And I got to a point where it was easier to stop believing. I said, you know what, God, I'm just not going to believe in you anymore. Because it's easier to not believe in you than it is to believe in you and wonder where you are. Now that was a real fight. It was a real battle that I was having with God there. Where are you? And then another one is I'm pleading for something. God, please, I beg you. God, why haven't you helped? God, please heal this person. God, please let this miracle come to pass. God, please protect my family or me or this situation. God, I'm pleading with you. Please. And you're wrestling with God over that. And then the one that gets us all more times than we'd like to admit is the no, I will not. Well, God says, you know, I want you to do something. He puts a burden on your heart, a conviction. And you know that you're supposed to make 
healthy, a healthy decision. You're supposed to take a certain path. You're supposed to lead your family in a certain way. You're supposed to drop something. You, you know there's something that you're supposed to do. God's calling you to it. He's speaking it on your life. And at first, it starts with a very stern no. We say, God, no. I'm not going to do that. Refuse. I absolutely will not do it. And then over time, that no becomes less stern because we get used to saying no. Like, no, 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 not doing it. And then we just turn our head away from him altogether. But this is a a fight, a battle that we come up against. No, God, I will not. I will fight you because I will not do what you've asked me to do. I won't trust you. I won't follow you. And so just through these examples, I mean, I just picked a few out of the hat of my own life. Everything on this screen is something that I've said. I didn't get this out of a book. This just came from, okay, let me look at my experiences here. So we can all, I think we can identify with this. We've all fought and we've all wrestled with God. We have. And it doesn't mean that there's something necessarily wrong with us. We're not sinful. We're not lacking in faith. And actually, you know what? We are sinful because we're born sinful. And we always never, it seems like we never have enough faith. But what I want you to know is where you are in your current position as a person, as a Christ follower, or as somebody that's not a Christ follower, where you are right now, it's okay. It's good enough. It's got you here to this room and this place for this moment to hear this talk. And I believe that that's for a reason. So don't discount yourself. Don't discredit yourself. Don't say, well, I, I can't, none of this applies to me because this applies to people that are, are holy or they're, they're Christians or you know the people that are in the church that have their lives together or it seems like their lives are together. Yeah, this applies to them, but me in the middle of my fight? No, this, this, this can't apply to me. So I'm wanting to penetrate that. I'm wanting to penetrate through that thought that you have that this doesn't apply to you. And we're going to do this real simple. There's a, a, a guy in the Bible that we're going to look at. His name is Jacob. And Jacob is the man that literally wrestled with God. I mean, literally. He wrestled with God. And Jacob's life is, you know, quite an interesting story. And I thought, what better way to understand what it's like to fight God than to look at the guy that actually literally wrestled with God. This is the same God that Moses said, you know, God, let me see you. And God said, no, you, you can't even handle my, my face. You know, I'll, I'll pass before you, but you can't look at me. Now, this is that God, the God in the burning bush, the one you're not supposed to look at or, or supposed to acknowledge. The God in the Old Testament where if you went into, you know, for those of you that are, are new to the Bible, in the Old Testament, they carried around this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what that is, you can watch Indiana Jones. You can get all the history that you need to from that movie. Right? Right? Who's been there? Yeah, some of you, we're, we're, we're connected. Our souls are connected. But, you know, so, so they, they carried around this Ark of the Covenant, and it had God's presence in it, had the Ten Commandments in it, had a staff in it, a few other little odds and ends. Uh, it's kind of like a, a holy junk drawer. And uh, no, it wasn't that. My wife's shaking her head. And I thought, in case lightning comes down, let me move around here. But, but if you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you just died because God's presence was so holy. There's a story of it almost falling over, and a priest reached out to steady it with his hand. And he fell down and died. You know, that, that sounds kind of mean, but don't you think the creator of the universe can sort out his own box? You know, this guy, was, yeah, this guy was struggling with that, so he put his hand to steady it. You know, they just walked through a parted ocean with this thing. And so he, he passed away. But that's the presence of God. And that presence of God comes in man form, and Jacob wrestles that guy, that presence. And so we think about our fight with God. You know, for what I can tell, none of us have wrestled the physical presence of God, but we do wrestle with God. So let me tell you, how do we get to the place where Jacob wrestles God? First, I just want to read you the, the text. Let me read the story to you, then we're going to back up and explain it a little bit. So Genesis 32, 24 through 30. If this story is uh, interesting to you, you know, look it up when you get home. 
Open it up in a study Bible. Check it out on Google. It's really some amazing. There's so much in Jacob's story I wish I could tell you. Uh, I just don't have time, but there's so much cool stuff in there. So Jacob was left alone, and I'll, I'll give you context later. Jacob was left alone, and a man came and wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched his hip joint, and Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. And, and then in verse 26, it says, you can go to the next verse. There we go. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. This is a man of God says, Jacob, let me go. The day is breaking. Do you think God was a vampire? You know, like, the sun's coming up, I got to go. Some people argue that this is like, an, it's not actual God, it's an angel. And the angel was like, God wants us on time. There's a morning worship session. You know, I've got to let you go. I've got to get to heaven and do that. If I miss that, then I'm not going to get in at all there. But, you know, for whatever reason, he says, hey, the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. So he asked him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. And then in verse 28, he says, there we go. You guys can get quicker on that back there. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and you have still prevailed. Verse 29. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he declared a blessing over him. And it's, this is the blessing of the covenant promises on Jacob there. That's the same blessing he gave Abraham. Like, I'm going to make your... Your, uh, your descendants as, as many as there is sand and stars in the sky. and So Jacob named the place Peniel, the face of God. For I have seen God face to face, yet my life has not been snatched away from me. So that's the story. Jacob fighting with God. But how did we get, how did we end up with Jacob fighting against God? Same question we ask ourselves. How do we end up here? How do you end up in the place where you are this morning where you're fighting with God? It's not a trick question. It's, in fact, it, it's very simple. See, there's a history to Jacob. There's a history that led him there. And what I thought was really interesting is I was looking at the word history. Within history, if you're clever enough, you can find his story. See, it's our, our stories that lead us to the places that we are. You're fighting with God over something. You're wrestling with God. You have a story that has brought you there. Your fight is complex, and it involves all kinds of outside sources. It's not just because you're rebelling. It's not just a simple thing. You know, it's stuff that you have control over and stuff that you don't have control over. It's the way you were raised, the influences brought on you. But what I just want you to understand and accept is, is you know, your fight with God right now, Ending up in this place has a lot to do with your history, which has a lot and everything to do with your story. And so Jacob's story, I'm going to give you a little bit of Jacob's story, since we're going to look at this, this guy that wrestled with God. So Jacob was born to a guy named Isaac. And when he was born, he actually was born twins. Who's had twins? Raise your hand. Yeah, I don't know if Will's in here. Yeah, whew, God bless you guys. When Casey and I were, 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 were ready to have like our first kid, I thought, let's just go for twins because that's like more bang for your buck. You have one pregnancy and you get two for the price of one, right? Right? And then you only have to go through that, you know, one time and you get two. Praise the Lord. God did not answer that prayer because when we had one and then we got to know people that had two, I thought, no, no thank you, no thank you. So anyway, Jacob's mom... Uh, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca and Isaac got together and it was twins. And Jacob comes out of the womb holding onto his older brother Esau's ankle. So that's kind of where he gets his name because the Hebrew for Jacob is very similar to the sound of the Hebrew for the word supplement or, or uh, supplant. So it's almost like to sweep someone's feet out from under them. And so Jacob comes out holding on to Esau's uh, holding on to Esau's heel, which t takes me back to the whole childbirth process and just how weird that whole twin thing would be, you know. So poor Rebecca, she gets these kids out of her, and as they grow up, Esau grows up to be his dad's favorite. 
And, and he, he's called Esau because it means red and hairy. In fact, he comes out of the womb like super, super red and super, super hairy. And Jacob, you know, never had to shave a day in his life. He's, you know, smooth skin. And so Esau is his dad's, like, favorite. He's the hunter. He's the guy that goes out and kills stuff and brings it back. And Jacob is the domesticated one. He stays at home, and he stays with his mom. It's his mom, you know, his mom, Jacob, was his mom's favorite. Esau was his dad's favorite. And so they grew up this way. There's a couple really pivotal things that happen here. See, Esau is the firstborn. He was the special one, the favorite from his dad. He had, like, the birthright. We talked about last week, Elisha asking Elijah for a double portion. So he was wanting the inheritance Well, this is what Esau has, which means that, just put it practically for you, Esau is set for life. He's got a double portion of all the animals. He's got a double portion of the the house, the money, the business, everything. So Esau is set for life here. All he's got to do is step into that. He comes in from hunting one day, and Jacob is cooking a bowl of beans, lentils, And while he's cooking these beans, Esau comes in and says, hey, give me a bowl of those beans, buddy. You know, and Jacob says, you know, he could have just given him the beans, but he says, "Uh, sell me your birthright. Trade me your birthright. And this was something they could do. He really could. He could trade his birthright. People have traded it for a sheep. They've traded it for different things. So he gives away his birthright for beans. You know, it's not that these beans were that great. It's that he didn't care about his birthright that much. And so Jacob steals his birthright there. And then later on, his dad, Isaac, is sick and he's blind and he can't see. And he wants to bless uh, Esau because he thinks he's about to die. You know, he's a little bit dramatic here. He's blind and he's like, I'm about to die. I'm about to pass away. Bring my, my, my eldest Esau in. I want to bless him. This dude lived another 40 years after this moment happened here. I just see Rebecca's wife being like, Why are you being, stop being so dramatic. You got plenty of time to go. But he he tells his son Esau, go kill kill something and bring it in and cook it for me. I love you and I I would love to eat that. And then I want to give you your blessing. I want to bless you. He didn't know that he had sold his birthright. And so Rebecca, the helicopter parent, any helicopter parents in here? She, She overhears this and she's like, oh no. You know, Esau's going to get the blessing. So she goes to Jacob, here's what you're going to do. She goes out, kills a goat, puts the goat skin on him so that he would feel like Esau. Think about how hairy Esau was, you know, for a goat skin to be the equivalent of, uh, of how hairy he was. So he puts that on. She comes up with this whole scheme. So Jacob goes into Isaac with the food, with the goat skin, smelling like Esau. And he, he feeds it to him, and Isaac's like, well, you, you, you smell and you feel like Esau. You sound like Jacob. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm Esau. It's Esau here. You know, feel, feel the hair. It's pretty much me because Isaac is completely blind. So he blesses him. Jacob walks out. He has the birthright, and he has the inheritance. Now, who do you think in this equation would end up hating Jacob? It's his brother Esau. Esau comes in to cook the food for his dad, shows up and says, here you go, Father, I'm ready for my blessing. And Isaac goes, oh, no, I've already done that. Wait a minute, what do you mean? He says, no, it's it's done. I I did it. He says, you could have done it because it wasn't me. I was out hunting. I wasn't in here. It must have been Jacob that stole the blessing. And it you know, instead of Isaac saying, well, okay, we'll go and we'll figure it out. We'll redo it. You know, uh, Isaac tells him, like, well, you know what? It sticks and there's nothing left for you. And in fact, I have no blessing for you. And in fact, you are going to end up serving your brother and your people are going to end up serving your brother's people. And so naturally Esau, he says, the second that you old man finally die... I'm going to go and I'm going to kill Jacob. So the helicopter mother, Rebecca, hears this. She says, Jacob, you got to get out of here. So Jacob goes. See, see Jacob's life starts out here uh, with a lot of chaos. But Jacob's life starts out, he is a, like a master manipulator. And his mom is a master manipulator. They've manipulated this whole thing. 
And it ends up getting Jacob to the place where he's going to be put to death by Esau, so he flees. He goes to uh, his mom's brother's house, 400 miles away, quite a ways off. And he goes there, and he goes to marry, ends up marrying this, this girl named Rachel. It's a bit complicated. He actually uh, he, he shows up at this guy Laban's house, picks Rachel, says, I want her to be my wife. Uh, he has like a real studly experience. He actually goes to where all the shepherds are watering the sheep. And this pretty lady walks up and he says, ha, who are you? And she says, oh, I'm Rachel. I'm from Laban's house. He says, oh, it just so happens. I'm here to, experience, I'm here to go stay with Laban, hang out with him. You know, I'm going to spend time with him. I, I come from his family. And she's like, oh, that's amazing, you know. We should really like get together, have a coffee, hang out. And he's like, what are you guys all doing here? The sheep, it's, you know, it's the middle of the day. Why don't you water them and send them out? Because you know, I'm an expert. I know everything there is to know about sheep here. You know, really kind of trying to show off here. And she says, you know, we're, we're waiting on all the other shepherds to come because there's a big rock in the way. Well, guess what Jacob does? Like any other testosterone-filled uh, young man or middle-aged man, walks over to it, moves it out of the way himself. So they water the sheep. He's like, yep, it's the muscles here, you know. So he ends up going to Laban and asking for Rachel's hand in marriage. He says, cool, that's all great. So they have the wedding ceremony. But think about how crazy this is. The Bible's wild. Wedding ceremony. It's a seven-day party. Jacob sleeps with the wrong woman. Laban tricks him. Jacob goes in to consummate the marriage, which is the Bible way for saying... Well, you know. Jacob goes in to do that, doesn't realize it's the wrong woman there. Because Laban sends his daughter Leah, who is the firstborn, in there instead. Jacob wakes up in the morning, rolls over. Oh, Rachel, I'm so glad that we're married. No, nah, it wasn't Rachel, it was Leah. The Bible even says that Leah was ugly. That's not, I'm not being mean here. That's what the Bible says. That she was not nice on the eyes. It's so Jacob who goes to Laban. What? I'm like, come on, man. It's the wrong woman here. Laban's like, well, you know, it's customary. I can't give the second away until I give the first away. So he'd worked seven years for that right. And so then he says, this is not on. So Laban said, okay, fine. You can have Rachel as well now that you've married Leah. So, so Jacob gets Rachel as well. Works another seven years for Laban. And that would start this whole interesting period in Jacob's life where Jacob was started his life as the one that was deceiving people. And then when he's with Laban, he spends his time there, 14, 21 years actually, being deceived over and over again by Laban. You know, he married the wrong woman to him. So he would end up having both these women working 21 years with Laban. Laban would trick him into taking on an extra wife, and Laban would change his salary, change his pay like 10 times. Laban was manipulating the master manipulator. And so Jacob, he leaves, he flees. And as he's fleeing, he has an encounter with Laban. They end up working things out. And then Jacob hears from God, I want you to go back home. Now, what does Jacob think is waiting at home? It's Esau. What's the last thing that Esau said to him? When my old man dies, I'm going to kill you. And so Jacob hears from God. You're going to go back home. And Jacob thinks, oh no, now I've got to deal with this Esau issue. So Jacob, very cleverly, he sends a messenger ahead. And what's neat, I don't have time to unpack it, is this messenger is actually an angel. He sends this messenger ahead. The, the angel comes back and he says, hey, Esau's ready to meet you. In fact, he's coming to meet you. And he has 400 people with him that are part of this welcoming party slash army that are coming to meet you. So Jacob thinks, I'm a dead man. It's over. This is done. So Jacob then, as a dead man, now he begins to fight and wrestle with God. This is where it really begins. See, there's this complicated, complex history that brought Jacob to a place of wrestling with God. Just like you have this complicated, complex history. There's parts of your past that you know were not okay and right. And now you may be called to reconcile or be held accountable for that. There's parts of your past where people took advantage of you. And that's causing you, you know, strain and strife. And now you're having to wrestle with and deal with that. 
See, Jacob's life is this perfect example of he's his own worst enemy, plus he's also gotten himself into a mess with others, and then that's created this very complex situation with him where he thinks, I'm dead, my life is over. That's when the real wrestling with God began. Not in the match, but leading up to that. So Jacob hears Esau's coming to kill him. So Jacob thinks, I'm going to get clever. Divides his camp into two camps. Puts all his favorites on one side, takes all the second rates, puts them on the other. Because he figures that, hey, if Esau attacks and he kills one of us, then the other one can still get away. So he divides his camp. Then he sends a whole bunch of gifts, goats, donkeys, sheep, everything to Esau. But he spreads them out. You go to Esau, take all the sheep we have. Okay, then now you go and you go. And everyone that goes is supposed to say, this is from your humble servant, Jacob. So he's trying to butter up, you know, Esau, trying to keep him from killing him. And then after Jacob does that, he has this prayer with God. It's a prayer that we pray. Like, God, don't you remember that you're the one that asked me to do this? And now here I am. My life is up against the line. God, don't you remember that you're the one that promised that my generation would be, you know, as abundant as sand on the beach or as stars in the sky? Don't you remember that? God, don't you remember that I'm I'm just doing what you asked me to do here? So you, don't let me die here. Don't let me down. You know, it's it's that prayer that we pray. God, come on. You're the one that told me to step out in faith and have these kids. Now they cannot stay sick. You've got to heal these kids. God, you told me to step out in faith and to quit my job and and take a pay cut for the the, the sake of a happier family or for whatever the reason. And now you're saying, God, remember, you told me to do this. I'm back kind of up against the wall here. We're about to wrestle because you put me in this situation. I mean, I'm just obedient and I followed you and now look at where I am. Now I'm in a real mess here, a real pickle. And so... Jacob prays this prayer that we pray all the time. And then Jacob, one night, he's just had it. He says, you know what? I give up. It is what it is. And he takes his two wives and his two servants and his kids, 11 of them, and he sends them like across a brook. And then Jacob, he gets by himself. And it's the first time that Jacob gets alone here. Verse 24, it says, so Jacob was left alone. See, Jacob left himself in a position where he backed himself against the wall with no one else around him so that he, he, he had to deal with the situation that he was in. See, it wasn't until Jacob got alone that God could deal with him. You know, it's not until you finally get alone that God can deal with you. You know, you might as well just step into this wrestling match. You might as well just step into it. You, you can try and avoid it for a whole lot longer, but just, just get there. Let's just wrestle God. Let's just go through it. Get yourself alone. So Jacob, he, he backs himself in. And there's nobody around. It's the middle of the night. He's alone. No more distractions. No more camp life. No more wives. No more kids. Just Jacob alone with his thoughts. Finally, He's ready for God to deal with him. Now look, in verse 24, it goes on. See, we missed this when we read it the first time. And a man came and wrestled with him. Jacob did not wrestle with the man. The man wrestled with Jacob. Jacob did not yell at the man walking by and say, Hey, you, let's get in a fight. Now, he didn't do that at all. This man shows up out of nowhere, uninvited, unannounced. And he picks the fight with Jacob. See, Jacob didn't wrestle with God. God wrestled with Jacob. Why would God pick the fight with Jacob? Partly because he was alone. And the other part is that God wanted all. God wanted all of Jacob's proud self-reliance, his fleshly scheming. God came to take it and to take it by force. See, guys, when we wrestle with God or when we're up against a battle with God, you take your history, your past, you take all that. Like, God wants you alone. If you will just get alone. Now, if you don't want to deal with this with God, then just never be alone. But if you just want to, like, just like Jacob, like, let's get this thing over with. Let's just step into this thing. Let me just be honest about where I'm at in my, in my life. Get yourself alone. It's God that came for Jacob. That picked a fight with Jacob. 
Because he, he wanted to exhaust Jacob's pride. He wanted to exhaust Jacob's self-reliance. He wanted to exhaust Jacob. You know what, 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 I, what I love? A long time ago, God had to teach me a lesson in pride about accepting donations. Casey and I uh, have been missionaries for a long time. We've lived on donor support for like 15, 12, 10 years, something like that, like for a long, long time. And when I started out, you know, I quit my job and I quit my paycheck and everything. And I started fundraising so that I could come to, to South Africa to work with an organization, an NGO. And people would say, you know, hey, we want to support you. We want to help you. And it was like, oh, it's great, fantastic. But then sometimes people would say, hey, can I, can I buy you this or can I get you this? And it was like, no, I'm, I'm okay. No, I'm fine. And then other times people would just give like over and abundantly. They were just like give you an amount and you'd look at it and say like, you know, come on now. Like that amount that makes you feel uncomfortable, you know. If I walk up to you and I give you 200 rand, it's like, hey, thanks, I'll take that. If I walk up to you and give you 20,000 rand, it's like, well, okay, now what do you want from me, you know. What's up here? I'm uncomfortable. I'm not okay with accepting this. No, 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 you keep it. And God just humbled me. And he said, you don't get to determine what I give you and what I don't give you. So it, God had to like exhaust my pride. And that's what God is doing here with Jacob, exhausting it. Guys, I don't know what you're bringing into the battle. God wants to pick a fight with you. And there's something in you that God's going to need to exhaust in order to get down to the rest of it, in order to get to the bottom of it with you. And with Jacob, it was self-reliance. And it was this fleshly scheming, because Jacob was scheming to keep himself alive. Send the sheep here and the goats here and divide the camp and send the wife over here and pray the prayer to God and yada, yada, yada and all that. And none of it counted for anything because Jacob still found himself all alone. And a man comes up, God in human flesh, and wrestles with him. See, God is not wanting to pick a fight against you. Instead, he's fighting you for you. Think about that. He's fighting you for you. So if you take your current wrestling match with God, and you think about it that way, instead of you fighting against God or God fighting against you, think about it that maybe God is fighting you for the benefit of you. Maybe this is actually a really good thing. So then Jacob, he, he goes, and, and the next verse here, it continues on in the story. See, it's Jacob is alone. The man comes up and wrestles him. And he wrestles him until daybreak. All night long, Jacob wrestled God. You know, you know how big his muscles had to have been to have done that? The endurance that he had to have, have done, you know, had to have had to do that? I get winded pushing my kid up and down the driveway. And here you have Jacob that's fighting God until daybreak. Jacob must be incredibly, incredibly strong, right? No, Jacob is incredibly, incredibly just stubborn and hard-headed. See, th this isn't in here to display Jacob's greatness. This is in here to display Jacob's inability to let go and lose the fight to God. He, he just refuses to let go and let God have it. God has come into his life in a moment where he's alone and is fighting against Jacob for Jacob. And all night long, Jacob refuses to let go of it. That, that is this determination. See, Jacob's determination to fight till morning, it's no greater than our determination to fight for our own way with God. How long have you fought for your own way with God? How long have you fought against God? Because you want it your way. And you wonder why this battle with God is, is, is raging on for days and days and months and months. And some of us... We've been fighting God for years. That's your version of until daybreak. You just are still in that battle. But it's not because you're so strong that you're surviving a battle with God. It's just because you're so determined to fight for your own way with God. But you know what? You're not stronger than God. You, you're not going to win that battle. But see, God is such a, a mercy-filled, gracious God that He will let you fight Him. He will let you exhaust yourself. But the moment that he's ready to put you in your place, to humble you, to take care of your pride, 
to work with you, to move you forward. He could just he could end it just like that. Now, I think that it's better to end a fight with God by saying, I'm done, no thank you, I'm out of here. But that's, that's not our human nature. It wasn't Jacob's either. Jacob represents us as that human nature. So he fights, he fights, and God says in this next verse, this is where God tells him, when the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he said, okay, this ends now. He touched his hip, touched it wasn't, he threw him in an overhead suplex and jumped off the top rope and hit him with like the people's elbow and gave him the eye, of the, you know, the rock's eye, the people, you know, we, did any of us watch wrestling? It, was, it wasn't that. It, was, it wasn't like God did that in this epic moment of, of just, I guess now more people watch, you know, anime and stuff, like where you have just all this. It wasn't that at all. It was just a simple God, it's like Jacob's battle, fight, all this stuff, and God just goes, touch, to show that it was his supreme power. God was letting Jacob exhaust himself. He'll let you exhaust yourself. And God may come to a point in your life where he says, this is now done. I'm going to take you. I'm going to move you forward. And he just, touch, hit the hip. And then Jacob was done. He dislocated it. He could no longer wrestle him. See, this is the, I want you to get to this place. I want you to get conquered. Because when you're conquered, it's the most invaluable place to be. See, because we can't conquer much of anything until he conquers us. You know, we can't conquer, you're not going to beat, defy, conquer anything until God conquers you. Get into the fight with God. Get alone. Stop putting this thing off. If that means you're going to fight him for the next two weeks, then fight him for the next two weeks. In the meantime, I'm going I'm to be praying that God just starts touching hips all over the room and all over in your lives and just reminds you that he's God. He's the one that lets you fight with him. He's the one that lets you argue and battle with him. And then he's the one that says, it's done because I'm supreme over you and I am God over you. And let me remind you, I'm fighting you because it's for you. And he goes on in verse 28 or 26. He says, then he said, let me go. This is... The man, this is God in flesh saying, Jacob, let me go. Jacob says, I will not let you go. In Hosea, it talks about this verse. In Hosea, it says that Jacob is bawling. He's crying. See, Jacob was touched by God. His hip was taken and he was conquered. And so when Jacob is conquered, he holds on to God, the tightest. So tight that God says, let me go. And he says, no, no. See, it's not a put-together, strong Jacob that grabs God to hold himself up. It's the conquered, broken, dislocated hip Jacob that grabs God to hold himself up, that refuses to let go of God. He says, no, you got to bless me before, you let, before I let go, because as soon as I let go, then it's me walking on my, on my lame hip. It's me walking on my injuries. It's me realizing the flesh that I bring into it, it's me realizing that I'm just this mere little human thing and that you are this amazing God. So he says, please bless me because now I'm reminded of where, where I am in my relationship with you. How dare I fight against you? So he's just holding on to God. So we hold on to God when we're conquered, when the fight is let out of us. But being conquered, it is the best place that you can be. So he goes after this in the next verse. He asks him, because Jacob asked him for a blessing. And he says, what's, what's your name? And he says, oh, my name is Jacob. And then in verse 28, and he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but it's going to be Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men. That's Jacob's past, right? And you have prevailed. And then he declared a blessing. And this blessing is of the covenant promise of Jacob. And then this is when Jacob says, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life has not been snatched away. You know, our, 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 our blessing, Jacob's blessing, was that he received a, a, a new identity. Is that the Jacob that walked into the fight with God was not the same person that walked out of the fight with God. See, God associates identity with names. So he said, What's your name? Saying, 
uh, what did you bring into this fight? Okay, then that's no longer there. Your name is not Jacob anymore. Your name is Israel. I'm going to bless you. So that, that, that's, that's, that's a good way to come out of a fight with God here. It is. So I, I don't know what you've brought into this fight with God. I don't know if you are fighting with God. But I, I hope that, that through, you know, through the story of Jacob that you could just be encouraged and that you can kind of um, feel like your battle, your fight with God is okay. You know, I know where Jacob was in the Bible, alone in the middle of the night when he fought with God. But the place where you fight is the last thing I want to show you here. Where you are in your battle right now is the place of special trial and testing. It's a place of intense pleading to God. It's a place of seeing God face to face. And it's the place of conscious weakness. This is the place where you realize where you are and you realize who God is. It's a good place to be. So if you're fighting God,